Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our inaugural Investing 101 session for the year 2021. My name is Ernest, and I'm the host and the moderator for this evening. Tonight, I have Tim Phillips, our content composer, also known as our head of content of Prosperous, alongside with me. A brief introduction of Tim. Tim has over 10 years of experience in the financial industry, including over five years as an investment writer with Schroeder's covering Asian stocks, bonds, and multi-asset. He also spent time with Motley Fool Asia as head of content for the Hong Kong and Singapore sites. He has his passion for long-term investing and helping people build their wealth responsibly in financial markets. Tonight, we will be having our first part of the investment education series from Team. My name is Ernest. I'm currently the Director of Client Success for Prosperous. I'm also heading the digital business and strives to drive digital innovation through our investment platforms. So what's Prosperous? Prosperous is a multi-asset investment platform for targeted at the millennial segmentation. So to follow us on our Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn pages for more updates. You can also scan the QR code on the right uh, or visit prosperous.asia to learn more about multi-asset investing. So tonight we have $10 worth of grab vouchers limited to 30 successful respondents. Today, we will be talking about learning to grow your wealth. So I believe that um, we just uh, crossed past Chinese New Year and uh, we will be getting our bonuses or we have get our bonuses already. So first poll for tonight that I require the audience to do a short poll with me. The first poll, sorry for the technical glitch. How would you spend your bonus or ang pao money this year? So we'll do a one minute countdown to see how, uh, what would you like to do? So there are several options that we have here, putting your money into a fixed deposit or savings account, saving for retirement, paying off your loans and bills, invest and grow the wealth, going on shopping spree, I don't splurge on good food, right? So I think the earlier part of this year, we all know that Sing Xiong had got up to 16 months of bonuses. So if you are one of them and you think that, what can I do with those monies? Um, I believe tonight's seminar would be one of the things that you can do. So let me see, I think 70% of the people has already voted. Uh, let's wait a bit more to see what, uh, what would you like to spend the money on? Okay. So you see, oh, that's interesting. So we have about 69% of people saying that uh, they invest to grow their wealth. So absolutely welcome to the um, webinar for tonight. So with all your experience, I'll hand it over to you because uh, I think most of them would like to hear how we can grow their wealth. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Ernest. Um, thanks for that, guys. Uh, so basically what I'm gonna do today is kind of go through um, three different assets within the equity class, within the sort of stock class. So I'm gonna be covering stocks, um, ETS, which are exchange traded funds, and then finally uh, mutual funds. But you know, some of us may also know it as uh, unit trusts. Um, so I think there are lots of misconceptions around the three and you know how best they can serve your financial needs. So I think I kind of wanna go through each of them and how I think about it personally as, a, uh, as an investor approaching each of those asset classes. Um, so let me just uh, get my screen up and I can share. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so learning to grow our wealth in this auspicious year. Um, I've got the uh, obligatory um, sort of compliance compliance disclaimer here. So this is my own opinion. Uh, you know, this is not personalized financial advice, just in case our compliance team comes knocking tomorrow morning. Um, so this is all my own opinion. And so please don't take this as a uh, personal financial advice. Okay, so I think we should start off with a refresher, right? So why should we invest? Um, it's quite easy, we kind of want to build wealth over the long term. Um, starting slow is fine. So you kind of got the uh, Usain Bolt there. 
you know, he's a, he's a slow starter when he sprints, but then he kind of catches up. So in terms of, in terms of the time you have not seconds, but you have sort of like years, actually decades to kind of catch up if you do underperform at the start. So I think just starting is the best way to, to kind of growing, growing your wealth. A lot of people just sit on cash and don't actually do anything with it. So I think just putting that cash to work and investing it, um, no matter how late it's, it's always good to kind of just get a start. Um, and so I think there are lots of, um, you know, a lot of people think that retirement schemes are going to are gonna cover you for your golden years, and that's not necessarily true. Um, so you're kind of seeing it in the Western world with the US and the UK and Europe, you know, pension systems are, are, are massively in deficit and there's just not got enough cash to, to help people sort of retire. Um, so basically, we're going to have to do it ourselves, right? We're going to have to invest ourselves. And so, for example, even in Singapore with a really, really um, sort of comprehensive retirement system here, you know, not many people think about it, but actually only about 7% of the CPF is actually ring fence for retirement purposes. I mean, you've got like, you know, MediShield, you've got all the other uh, kind of CPF funds that you can use for other purposes, but only a small amount of that is actually for your retirement. So I think it's something we should, uh, we should definitely think about. Okay, so before investing, I think this is how I think about uh, an investing checklist before you start investing, right? So for me, it's like the rule of five. Um, you kind of need to have these things sorted out before you invest. Uh, so for example, you know, first off, I think you need to have an emergency fund of cash that is crucial. So you need to have at least six months. And if you're a bit more conservative, you can have 12 months of expenses in cash, because the last thing you want to do is to be selling in a down market or when, you know, your investments are falling, because inevitably that's probably when you're going to need the cash. Um, and second, don't, don't ever borrow to invest. So I'm a huge, uh, I'm a huge, you know, sort of bear on the whole thing of taking on leverage and debt and, and taking that on to, to sort of make money because that's that's a sure way to kind of lose money in my eyes. Um, and number three, you know, I think aim to hold your investments for at least five years or think about holding an investment for a minimum of five years so that you're going to give it time to compound and you're going to give it time to grow because uh, as soon as you buy something, it's not necessarily going to go up sort of like 10, 15% the next day or even the next month or even that year. Uh, so give it time. Um, fourth, you know, accept that the stock market is volatile. It goes up uh, as well as down. And, you know, I think people are starting to realize it's going down. Uh, this week it's been going down. So that's completely normal. Uh, that's not something wrong with uh, the stock market. That's just a feature of it. Uh, and then five, you know, don't try to time the market. So don't try to be jumping in and out and trading a lot, you know, into and out of stocks or funds or ETFs or whatever else, because what you want to do is just try to stay invested and, and have that discipline. Okay, so I'm gonna go through each of these. I'm gonna go through stocks, uh, exchanges, exchange traded funds and mutual funds. Uh, you know, each, each one I'm gonna kind of cover what I think are the pros to each and what are the cons and then how I think the best way to approach each of those, uh, each of those assets. So I think first of all with stocks, right? What you have to understand is it's about owning a piece of a business, right? It's owning a company uh, and it's owning those companies cash flows and those profits. Um, so what you're, what you're buying when you buy a stock is actually a piece of a business. So it's actually not just a ticker on a screen or a number. You kind of have to think of yourself as a business owner. Um, I think just a quick breakdown, you know, if you're starting out, you know, obviously the world's biggest markets include the U.S. The U.S. is massive. Uh, Hong Kong and China is becoming more uh, and more relevant just because of the size. Uh, and Japan is always there, but it's a bit less accessible for foreign investors. Um, and it's an easy it's an easy buying and selling process, right? You buy a stock and then you you kind of get uh, that stock in sort of one or two days uh, in terms of the transaction date. Um, I think it's important to remember that the capital growth uh, and is only one aspect of it. Um, so when we talk about returns in terms of stock returns, they always talk about oh it's capital appreciation, but actually you should look at the total return, which is you have the capital appreciation, which is obviously important, but then also the dividend return as well. So there are dividends uh, which are paid out to shareholders, and that can obviously uh, contribute to the growth of your investment. So this is one thing that I think we should all be mindful of is that this, along with you know, ETFs and mutual funds, they all require patience and discipline if you want to build up your wealth over the longer term. It's not something that you're you know, sort of going to grow two, 300% in a year. Um, some people might like to think that from last year's gains in the stock market, but that's, uh, that's an anomaly and that is not normal. Um, so I think it's something that we should remember. Okay. So what are the pros? Uh, for me, I mean, uh, one of the most important things I think is you actually have control over what you own. Um, you know, in this sort of day and age uh, with ESG and with people being woke about what they own. People, a lot of younger people don't actually want to own, say, tobacco companies or oil companies 
or casinos um, or maybe cannabis companies. So what you what what you get when you buy a stock is you get the ability to choose what you want to buy. So I think that's really important. And it obviously allows you to align yourself with the company that you're buying. If you agree with their product, if you agree with their uh, sort of governance and their outlook on, on business, I think that's that's a great thing to have. Secondly, it gives you sort of zero holding fees. So I think with ETS and mutual funds, which I'll cover later, you actually have to pay a fee, obviously, to, to hold that. But once you buy a stock and you pay that commission to buy a stock, it's yours. And basically, it costs nothing to hold that forever. So you can hold that in your account and not pay anything on the honor of holding that stock. Um, and I think liquidity is something that we kind of overlook as investors. So to break it down into some more layman terms, liquidity is the ability to kind of access the money that you need when you need it. So for example, uh, real estate would not be a liquid investment because that takes time to buy, to sell, that can take maybe up to three or four months to actually get all the paperwork done and get like an assessment done and get a contract drawn up. Whereas a stock, again, you buy, it is in your brokerage account in sort of two days and then you sell and you get that cash within one or two days as well. And then finally, this is what I really love is beating the market, being able to actually select investments uh, and then actually beat a benchmark for example, the S&P 500 or, you know, uh, sort of MSCI World, which is, which is a, you know, a collection of the world's uh, top stocks. Um, it allows you to beat the market. So if you, you know, if you pick correctly, if you invest correctly and smartly, you can, uh, you can beat the market uh, average. Okay, so I think some of the cons, uh, this is one of my favorite films, uh, one of my favorite comedies, uh, you know, Anchorman, I think everyone should, uh, you know, if you've seen, if you've seen Will Ferrell, you'll know uh, what a comic is, but you know, the emotion, I think it's trying to avoid that emotion when you do invest that is really dangerous with stocks because stocks, uh, they do move. They're a bit more volatile if you're owning individual stocks and those movements, obviously you have to be emotionally ready to deal with those types of price uh, movements that happen, you know, day to day. Um, I think second, there needs to be an investment on your part. You have to actually be willing to go out and do that research and be really interested in the business and understand the business uh, and whether you actually want to put your money into it. So it's definitely an investment in time, which I think a lot of people obviously don't have. So I think that is something that you have to be a bit wary of um, or just cognizant of rather when you do invest in stocks. Uh, and then risk, this is something that I think is probably less relevant to ETFs and mutual funds because they're more diversified. But when you start building a portfolio of stocks, you're obviously going to be a bit weighted to certain stocks or to uh, certain sectors. So that's something that you have to be mindful of. And then finally, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So even though the internet has opened up the amount of information that we're actually able to access as, as, as investors, and it's leveled the playing field, I think, for a lot of people between professionals and retail investors, there's also a lot of short-term sort of trading noise out there where you know, they're trying to make 20, 30% in a day and they're trying to say, oh, it's time to sell this business because it's going to go down in the next sort of two, three months. But actually what you should try and do is keep that discipline and just keep investing for the long, long term. Um, so I think that's, that takes uh, a bit more uh, sort of tuning out that noise and, and being able to, to, to tell what's really news and what's just noise. Okay, so how do I approach stocks? So how do I think it's the best way to approach stocks? So I think if you're starting out and you haven't actually bought any stocks yet, I think it's useful to actually just have a watch list of maybe some really top notch, like reliable stocks that everyone's heard of, you know, sort of the Microsoft, Amazon, Apple's in the US. You can maybe have a few of those on there and like the Walmarts and the Costco's and the Targets. Everyone knows those types of stocks. There are, for example, dividend aristocrats in the US, which have been paying out rising dividends for the past sort of like 20, 30 years. Um, so I think starting out with a watch list and getting comfortable with, uh, with that watch list before you start buying is, is a good idea. And definitely diversify across countries and sectors. I think that's a problem that we see a lot is either people just buy all their home market. So they might just buy, if we live in Singapore, all Singapore stocks. Or they might just buy all US stocks, which is also, again, not a great idea. I think we need to kind of diversify between business, businesses and countries and sectors because that will vary globally and the, and the prospects will be different as well. And understand that you're buying a business, right? It's obvious that this is not just a ticker. As I said, this is a business. This is a real uh, cash generating uh, business that's serving customers. So I think just realize that you're a shareholder and a business owner in that as well. Uh, and accept that stocks go up, they go down. That's normal. And try and think of mixing up your stock styles. Don't just think that 
all growth stocks are a great idea and all dividend stocks are a great idea. There's no, there's no rule saying that you can't have a mixture of those types of stocks in your portfolio. Um, so keep that in mind and you know think about that in terms of how you build your portfolio. Okay, so I'm going to move on to exchange traded funds. This is you know obviously a big topic. It's kind of had a lot of traction in the past decade. Uh, it's just been a great vehicle, I think, for investors who don't have time and also people who want broad exposure uh, to the stock market to just buy a vehicle that gives you that uh, quickly and easily and also cheaply, I think, is cr the, crucial, uh, the crucial caveat there. Um, so what is an exchange traded fund? It's basically owning a basket of stocks uh, that are publicly listed. So it trades like a stock. It trades on an exchange. Uh, it, you know, obviously trades in real time. Um, and it's a key, the key word here is it's a passive investment vehicle. So you don't actually uh, do anything with the ETF and ETF provider doesn't actually have to hire anybody to run it. It's basically tracking an index. And so these indexes or these indices rather can be sort of like the S&P 500. They can be the MSCI uh, Asia X Japan maybe, or they can be um, you know the FTSE or the Straits Times Index or the Hang Seng Index. So there are all these different indexes, indices in different countries uh, and they can track those. And then finally, again, I would say requires patience and discipline, but this is just something we know for long-term investing, that's just a given. Okay, so pros. Instant diversification, you get that instant exposure across countries and sectors just because a lot of these ETFs will hold, you know, tens, if not uh, sort of hundreds of stocks in some cases. Um, and some of the biggest ETFs, you know, are super, super low fee. So, for example, the Vanguard uh, S&P 500 ETF, I think, is 0.03% is the expense ratio. It's pretty much being driven down to 0%. Um, so you're pretty much getting it at cost, right? Or it's basic, it's nearly free. Um, some of these really, really big ones. And because they're taking on more funds, they can drive down that expense ratio for investors. Um, so that's a great thing about it. So I think it's opened up the pool of, uh, of money. It's opened up the markets rather to a, a larger pool of money into to the everyday investor. And so the liquidity profile is quite similar to a stock. You can buy and sell it. So you can get it within a couple of days. That's also definitely a pro of it. Uh, and the convenience, I think it's just really easy because you, um, in this day and age where, you know, there are so many um, active managers underperforming, uh, just to have that and to get that access cheaply and to, you know, beat a lot of active funds just by tracking a benchmark is, is really, really great. So I think it's definitely served a, a wide range of investors uh, over, over the past decade. Um, okay, so what are some of the cons? I mean, there are some cons. I think you can kind of see on the chart on the right, uh, you know, the investments, uh, the ETF investment universe has grown exponentially. So it's humongous now. Uh, and obviously, because of that, there are certain uh, leveraged ETFs, synthetic ETFs, types of ETFs and compl complex ETFs, which maybe, you know, the everyday investor may not understand or may not realize the kind of risks that they're exposed to. Um, and I think one other thing we think about ETFs is you're obviously going to be forced to hold companies that you may not like or you may not agree with just because they happen to be part of the index. And so the ETF will be forced to buy a certain amount of that stock just because um, it tracks that index. Um, and when I guess one of the key ones for me is you're always going to match the market. Uh, I think that's one of the um, one of the key sort of downsides if you like to you know, take an active approach to investing is your investments will never beat the market. You'll just match it or probably under slightly underperform it because you're paying a slight fee. So you won't match it exactly, but you'll pretty much be in line, um, but you will never beat it. So I think that's, that's the key again. Um, so what was the best way to approach it? Uh, I think just identify the biggest and most liquid ETFs. That's the way I like to uh, make sure you know what you're buying. I think this is the case with a lot of people. They, they put a lot of, um, they, you know, they put money into an ETF, but they actually don't know what's in the ETF. Uh, so, for example, you know, a lot of um, a lot of indices in Asia, they have a lot of state owned companies, maybe large banks uh, that, you know, obviously you don't want to track. Or, and that's the case in Hong Kong with the Hang Seng Index. There are a lot of old economy sort of companies like banks and energy and oil and gas, which you may not want to own. Um, but there's, you know, there's an ETF that serves that. But it, perhaps maybe not the best thing for you to buy if you're thinking about longer term returns, because um, you kind of need to look back on the returns and see, have they been, uh, have they been performing? And so uh, number sort of like, yeah, I guess thirdly, I think I'd avoid the synthetic and leveraged ETFs just because at the, unless you're a bit more advanced in your knowledge of, of investing, uh, I think it's something that you should stay away from. 
Um, and then focus on what is actually an ETF and what is like a plain vanilla sort of ETF that owns the underlying assets that they claim to. And then finally, just like everything, diversify geography sectors. It's important. Uh, just keep that in mind. I think that's a key thing as well. Okay, so finally, mutual funds, unit trusts. Um, again, a similar concept to an ETF, you own a basket of assets. Uh, these can come in many forms. Uh, I think ETFs, I would point out ETFs and mutual funds, unit trusts, you know, you can have bond ETFs, you can have also bond unit trusts as well. Um, but the majority of them are, or the majority that we're familiar with is, is equities of stocks. Um, and the key difference with a unit trust and mutual fund is that it's managed by an investment professional. Uh, so it has benchmarks that they have to compete against and basically beat. Um, so obviously they do want to beat the benchmark that they're tracking or they're performing against. So a lot of U.S. active funds will obviously use the S&P 500 or maybe the Russell 1000, which is a larger, broader index of U.S. companies um, as, a, as an index that they want to beat or outperform. Uh, so the key word here, again, is active. So this is an active approach to investing. Um, and it deviates from sort of investing in the index or it says it, you know, will pick the better stocks that will outperform the index. But again, like the other two, it requires patience and it requires discipline. So what are the pros? Um, I think diversification is one of the pros. It gives you broad exposure, which I think is good, uh, similar to an ETF. Uh, you have professionals managing your money and research teams. So, you know, you would hope that they know what they're talking about or understand what they're buying and managing. Uh, that may not always be the case, but, you know, a lot of them do. So obviously there are some really great fund managers that have had great long track records out there, sort of like Peter Lynch with uh, the Magellan Fund in Vitality, sort of like 20, 30 years, you know, obviously delivered some amazing returns for investors. Um, you know, beating the market, you can beat the market because if you have a fund or a manager who's doing really, really well, they can easily beat the market. Uh, and then finally, I think it's flexible. So a lot of people can start out small, to invest monthly, um, you know, a lot of a lot of banks everywhere and, and distribution partners will have plans where you can start investing uh, small amounts monthly with you know with them in certain funds if you want to. So I think that's something uh, that is good if you're starting out. Okay, cons. Yeah, it's not cost effective in my eyes. Uh, it's nowhere near as cost effective as an ETF, but obviously you're paying for that potential to beat the market or beat the ETF, so to speak. Um, I would say single manager risk is something that isn't really appreciated much. Uh, you know, some managers have great runs, maybe 10, 15 years, they do really, really well, which is, you know, I think the longer the period, the harder it gets, uh, but then they might leave, right? Or they, or the team, or they might take certain key members with them somewhere else. So this outperformance can obviously be at risk. So you've obviously got that, uh, that single manager risk involved with, uh, with some of these star funds. And then finally, this is something which they probably don't like to talk about much, but which happens a lot in the industry is, you know, sort of mirroring and index hugging, which is basically having the same components as an ETF or the index that you're following and having it in the same weights um, so that you don't underperform, but then you don't really outperform that much. Um, so what you're effectively doing is mirroring the benchmark. Um, so what you're paying them for is to basically do the same, uh, the same, you know, have the same sort of function as an ETF. So that's really clearly not ideal. Um, but that happens a lot just because I think people are really scared of underperforming. So I think that's something that you need to be aware of, understand what the manager is tracking or the fund is tracking and, and kind of compare top holdings and see if they're exactly the same and exactly the same weightings uh, as, as, uh, as the fund that is uh, that you're buying. Okay, so the best way to approach mutual funds is, you know, understand what investment exposure you want access to, Study the fund's track record because that's really important and obviously the reasons for that. Uh, I would say separate out investment and insurance just because I personally don't like IOPs, you know, investment linked plans. I think it, if you're going to invest and if you're going to buy insurance, just do them separately. Don't do them as a hybrid because I don't think you, you get basically the worst of both worlds or you don't get the best of both worlds rather and you'd rather just invest separately and then also buy insurance separately because that gives you um, it doesn't tie one into the other and then also you know there are obviously a lot of like early breakout clauses and fees involved so i think it just isn't flexible for a lot of people um, and maybe people don't realize that so i think it's something that you definitely need to, to think about um, i personally would buy them more often i'm more into buying single stocks uh, to be honest but if i was to be buying mutual funds and i have in the past it's usually to access inaccessible markets 
So for example, India, um, you know, an Indian equity fund, uh, only in only in India, Indian citizen can actually buy Indian stocks listed on the Indian stock exchange. Um, and so maybe buying in Indonesia, if you wanted to buy an Indonesia equity fund, that also, um, you know, would probably be easier just doing through a mutual fund rather than trying to buy an Indian, an Indonesian stock. Um, so these are some of the, I think, some of the key things for the mutual funds. Okay, so um, what type of investor are you? I think I'll pass this on to uh, Ernest here, because I think Ernest kind of wants to uh, sort of run a poll. Thanks, Tim. Um, great sharing from your ETFs, shares, and mutual funds, and also your investment approaches. So mm. I think we all have a greater understanding of these products. So I think we need to take a poll right now to see what type of audiences um, our audiences are this evening. So let me start the poll. Okay, so Tim, while waiting, what type of investor are you? Passive, um, active, yeah. or a mix of both? I would say I'm active, as I said. I mean, I do kind of have that interest and curiosity with businesses and how the world is evolving. Um, so I like to have an active approach to investing and picking my own stocks and making sure the companies I own align with my own, you know, sort of ethic, ethical views and, and also my beliefs. So I am definitely an active investor. But I think there's, you know, there's no wrong or right answer. I think it's whatever approach you feel comfortable with. Absolutely. So, okay, I'm going to show you the results. Let's see. So basically, 57% ah, of everyone said that um, they are a mix of both. Yeah. Um, 37 about it active. That means they are willing to invest in stocks, mutual funds. And oh, very little uh, a minority is actually on the passive side. So right. um, without further ado, I think um, let's jump into the, the sharing from your end. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so thanks Ernest for, for that poll. That was interesting. So I think it's you know no surprise. I think there are there is definitely a place for passive in, in your in your portfolio. Um, so I think it's up to you, you know, in terms of how big that portion is or how how small that portion is. Um, but for me, I think understanding your investment approach is really, really important, right? So first off, are you an emotional investor? Um, if you are, that, then I think you uh, are maybe not suited to buying, you know, sort of more volatile stocks. But I'm hoping if you are an emotional investor, you can kind of control your emotions and think about um, how to, to manage the emotions. Because even like ETFs go up and down. So it's not uh, as though ETFs always go up and it's the same with mutual funds. So I think all these types of investments, you know, it, there's always going to be down days. There's always going to be days where things go down. So you have to really try and keep your emotions in check. Um, beyond that, you know, do you want investment exposure outside of Singapore or your home market? Um, I think that answer should be yes, just because I don't think you should have all your assets or exposure or uh, stocks in one country or, or one region. Um, I think that should be spread out across sectors and countries. Um, and again, what I'd said about growth or dividend or both, I don't think you have to be uh, labeled as one or the other. I think you can have a mixture. Uh, I think personally that's healthy. Um, and will you stay invested if there's a market crash, right? I mean, right now there, we're seeing markets come down, but that's obviously nothing compared to what happened last March. Um, so that's the kind of test I think you, you kind of need to ask yourself, right? If things do crash sort of 30, 40%, will you stay invested? Um, and that's key. So, I mean, I think when I think about investing and, and losses it's like you're never locking in a loss if it's on paper right but once you sell that is effectively a loss um so you have to think about that when you you know when the markets do come down um uh you know fourth do you want to own companies that reflect your values i do um if you don't that's fine uh you know there are etfs there are mutual funds you can pick stocks whatever stocks you like i think it's something you should just ask yourself and if, if you don't want to that's fine um, five, do you prefer to be invested in stocks, ETFs, or funds? Um, again, I think there is no right or wrong answer. You can have a mix or you can go with one or, or two or three. So I think it depends on your own, on your own preference. And then finally, I'd say have a plan, right? Don't go into something and not have a plan because, uh, that doesn't usually work well. So, you know, before you invest, I like, kind of have that game plan and try to stick to it. Um, and understand what you're investing with in mind, right? What are your goals? Are you, you know, investing for retirement? Are you investing to buy a house in like a decade's time? Then maybe you should think about maybe having less money in the stock market. Um, you know, are, are you willing to kind of stay invested to get those long-term returns? Because I think that is a key thing that you, you need to understand is you do need to be there uh, invested over the long-term to kind of realize those gains. 
uh, and know what you're investing in. I think that's something a lot of us maybe we're not aware of. We kind of buy an ETF and we don't know what's actually inside the ETF and we don't know what's inside a fund. So I think understand what you're investing in and if that's what you want to actually own. And then finally, controlling your emotions, right? That's obviously the key thing. I think a lot of the mistakes that we make as investors, because you know everyone makes them, I've made them in the past, is like we let our emotions get the better of us uh, when we are managing our own money or our own investments. And usually that's the worst, the worst thing that we can let uh, sort of influence our investment decisions is emotion. Um, okay, so with that, I think that's kind of the end of mine. I didn't want to keep you guys too long on everything. Uh, so thanks. Um, we've got question time here on, on Facebook as well as Zoom. Um, I do kind of want to plug the upcoming webinars that we've got. We've got two. Uh, so one on sort of global stock markets. I'm going to try and take viewers through, you know, the key stock markets in my eyes, which are US uh, and Hong Kong, China, because just because they're so big and there's the opportunity set there is so massive. Um, and then obviously we have Singapore as well. Uh, so that will be uh, covered just because we're based here. And obviously there are, there are some good, uh, great companies in Singapore as well. Uh, but it's good to understand what type of companies are in each market, what type of opportunities do they offer? And then why does the stock market size matter, right? I mean, the US is the biggest, uh, so you, you need to be there, I think, for longer term returns. Um, and then we've got one in mid-April on the US markets, which is, uh, you know, I'll break it down into more detail because there's a lot to go through. Uh, you know, US markets make up about 60% of the total market cap of the, of the whole world of listed equities. So the US is, is by far the biggest. Um, we'll look at the historical performance, why you need to stay invested, and then, you know, sort of the big winners in innovation. And what does that mean for the stock market? So I'm hoping you guys can join. Uh, that one, so those two, those two webinars upcoming. I think they'll be, they'll be fun. Okay, thanks, Ernest. Have we kind of got uh, questions to uh, to address? Yep, I think we are the last segment of Q and A. Come, let's have a look at a couple of questions. I think, sure. I think we received some questions through our Facebook Live. So sharing mm. Q and A. So the first question. Hmm, what percentage of my salary would you suggest I should put into investing if I'm earning like $2,000 a month? Um, well, I think the dollar amount is actually quite irrelevant. Um, but okay, thanks for, thanks for putting that, that out there. Uh, I, think the, I think the important thing is your percentage of your salary. Um, if you are younger, I think you, know, you can afford to be putting in a bit more. What you can afford to put in is completely subjective. So I don't want to put a number on that, but in terms of what I would personally be comfortable with is sort of in the range of maybe sort of like, like 30%, 25 to 30% of like, you know, total, total income um, to, to put that away to invest, but that's me. So that's a different, uh, that's a different uh, viewpoint. So I think the more you can save when you're younger or the more you can invest and the more time you have, I think that's good because you've, you're starting from a, a lower base and then you're actually giving yourself more time, sort of more you know, decades effectively to, to let that uh, compound for you in the markets. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but I, my personal uh, opinion on, my, on me is I would say sort of, yeah, 30%, 25 to 30%. Okay, that's so it's about say about $600, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Next question. Um, which of the three stocks, ETFs, and mutual funds do you think that millennials should invest at the start? Well, tough question. Um, I think if you've never invested before and you're starting, I think ETFs are a really great vehicle to invest in. I think they're, they will get you a bit more comfortable with investing. They'll get you a bit more comfortable with the stock market. They'll give you instant diversification uh, and exposure to the stock market. And you'll kind of understand how the stock market behaves and how it reacts. Um, if you do have that interest, you know, after initially investing in ETFs for a while, then I think maybe you can move on to stocks. And then if you want, you know, to mutual funds, but I think ETFs are a great low cost way for investors to get access to the market. And if you are starting out, I think, uh, an ETF is, is a great is a great way to do that. Yeah, but ETFs can give you a basket of products, right? You know, yeah, uh, accounts. Sorry, yeah. yeah, a basket of accounts, a basket of different stocks. Um, and if you do get interested in those individual stocks and businesses, then maybe you can learn more about them, and then maybe you can uh, obviously start buying stocks later. But I think 
if you are starting as a millennial, I think an ETF is a great is a great idea. Okay, great. I think I received another question from the polls, the Zoom site. Can you share your current top three stock picks in your own in your own opinion? I added it in the last few words. <laughs> uh, my current top three stock picks. Um, they haven't been reading our website enough, Tim. Yeah. I did this, I did this, um, I did this actually last week with Seedly. So I did cover my top three stock picks. Um, I would say they would be Ping An Good Doctor, which is a which is a telehealth company listed in Hong Kong, which is a subsidiary of Ping An Insurance. Um, I think it's a great business that you know has the ability to cross sell its um, its telehealth services via the insurance ecosystem. So I think that's a natural product market fit just because you have uh, an, a massive insurance player and ping on good doctor can leverage off that ecosystem to actually cross sell. And so it seems like a natural fit, right? If you're going to buy yep. life insurance or health insurance, why not do that through, uh, through ping on good doctor or have them as your provider and then be buying through ping on insurance. Right. Whereas with JD health and Alibaba health, they're obviously a bit more logistics e-commerce related. Um, so that's more about pharmacy refilling and delivery of drugs, uh, and delivery of medication, um, which I don't know if that is a unique, uh, a unique business proposition, but they, I'm, you know, I think the market is big enough in China for, for, for all those, for all the major telehealth players to, to do well. So, but for me, one of the top ones for me was, was this Ping On Good Doctor, just because of its online health dominance and the fact that it kind of, it dominates that, um, online medical services um, sort of business where it has its own in-house team of doctors. It's working with social, social health insurance uh, sort of payment officials in China. So in China, they have a, a SHI uh, system and they're kind of starting to integrate telehealth services into that so that you can actually re be reimbursed for those types of uh, services. Um, so I think it's something that the government is supporting. So I think that kind of, that kind of is helping also that, that business grow and that, um, that ecosystem grow. Uh, second was uh, DocuSign, right? I love DocuSign. It's a, it's a great service. It helps uh, you kind of save paper. It helps the world. Uh, it helps the world, you know, obviously not have to cut down loads of trees just to fill out pointless, endless forms of paper. Um, but the great thing about DocuSign is that the e-signature is just a gateway, right? It's just a gateway product. And what they're selling is actually a lot more beyond that. So when you do get that subscription to it, you get that e-signature service, but you also get, you also get um, sort of an AI yes, the, um, element, right? Yeah, you kind of get you kind of get a, a lot like more services that a lot of a lot of legal teams, HR, human, like you know, across the board, sales and marketing. You you think about contracts being filled out all the time. It happens all the time, right? Across divisions, across markets, um, across functions. So I think that's something that they've been growing and you know nearly 97% of their revenue or 95% is subscription based that's that's great to see um, so that's another business I like that was my second and then finally was Brookfield Renewable Partners which is a uh, a renewable energy provider uh, based in Canada but which is listed in on both the Canadian Stock Exchange and the, the New York Stock Exchange so it's dual listed um, and it's a great it's a great company and it's been paying rising dividends for you know so 20 years at about six percent per annum um, and it's, it owns, you know, renewable energy assets and it's growing massively into solar. Um, and it's got really, really visible, reliable cash flows and contract contracted cash flows. They're sort of like 10 to 15 years. So revenue visibility is very high. Um, so I think that's, uh, that would be my last. So, yeah, I don't think there are any secrets if anyone had tuned in last week to Dealey. So, um, those are my top three. Okay, let's go on to the next question. I think we still have some time for questions. Okay, which investment product did you start your investment journey with? I personally started it with a stock, um, but that's also because my dad, you know, uh, was in was starting to get into investing in stocks as well. So I think I was quite lucky that he had influenced me to kind of think about uh, think about stocks and think about putting money away from a young age and investing. Um, so I think that was my that was yeah that was definitely my first investment product was a stock um, can i ask what counter it was uh yeah it was hsbc uh just because you know you know in hong kong that was that was the go-to in hong kong um it's obviously my style's changed a bit since then um i think my second one was like mcdonald's or something i bought McDonald's oh, okay. when I was like 17 or 18 um but that's just something because i was familiar with but you know i think 
as you go on and as you start to invest and, and go on that journey, you definitely learn a lot. So um, I think just starting is really, really important. So I would just, you know, I would advise anyone just to get started is, is the best way to do that. It's just the best way to learn. All right. Next question. Let's see what do we have next on the pipeline. I don't even know. Okay. Comparing the product types mentioned today, which is the highest risk and least advisable for those who are those of us who wants to invest smaller amounts of money. Okay. Hmm. Um, uh, the product types, uh, obviously the highest risk is stocks just because it's single company uh, risk. So it's, that's, that's the highest risk because you're putting your money into a stock. Um, but obviously the reward on that, the flip side, the reward will, will likely be high if you're, if you're finding good stocks, right? Um, but if you're starting out, as I said, from the product types today, I, I would start out investing smaller amounts into, into an ETF. Um, you know, I think that is the best way to do it just because I think ETFs are very accessible and, uh, you know, you have a broad range of ETF options available to you. Uh, mutual funds, you know, I think you can invest smaller amounts as well, but just be mindful of making sure you're getting your money's worth and, and that it's growing uh, in, and outperforming. I think that's the key. Yeah. No, agree. But um, this is my own personal question like that, you know, mutual funds, you have to pay a fee. Yeah. Um, ETFs as well as probably stocks, you just pay your commissions, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, on that hindsight, uh, I would think that ETFs, uh, ETFs and, and stocks would be something more palatable to me if I want to hold long term because I don't need to pay for ongoing costs. What's your view on that? Now, yeah, if you're talking about ongoing costs, for sure, it's the cheapest. I mean, the cheapest is stocks because you buy that commission, you pay that commission, right? And then you're done. So that's the cheapest. The next cheapest is ETS because it's basically some of them are like 0 0.03. So that's really cheap. But in terms of risk, I mean, obviously, I think a stock is riskier than a ETF would be just because an ETF holds however many stocks, right? It's got sort of a basket of 100 or whatever. So just because of that, the risk level, I mean, you know, but risk is uh, it's not necessarily a bad word. You know, it's it's risk because you have a single uh, counter, a single stock. Um, but if you have the right stock, then obviously the rewards can be, can be, um, you know, can outperform, but it depends on that. But if you're talking about purely from a, a concentration risk aspect, then obviously stocks are, are more risky. Yeah. Okay. Next question. I think we have a lot of questions this evening. Okay. New investors seem to focus on technology stocks as they have shown <laughs> huge growth in short period. Yeah. Tesla, Apple, what, are, what other sectors can I look at for diversification? Yeah. Um, well, I think technology, you know, obviously there's reason for that. They, they have, uh, you know, growing cash flows and they, they're great businesses, but I agree that's, it's kind of been hot obviously for, uh, for a while. Um, other sectors that I think are, you know, that, that definitely have potential longer term is for example, you know, healthcare, I think is something that people maybe not think about immediately, but there's a lot of, um, you know, innovation going on, whether that's in, you know, genomic sequencing or whether that's in biologics and, you know, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the farmers in, in the West are starting to experiment with new ways of doing things and new, um, uh, new vaccines, for example, you saw the, uh, the mRNA, the mRNA rather. Um, so that's, I think this kind of thing and the way that we think about looking after elder populations and an aging population globally. Uh, healthcare will always be, I think, a massive part of any economy. And it, for example, in China, you know, you're looking at healthcare spending being about sort of six, seven percent of GDP compared to the US, where it's at 18 or 19 percent. So the growth potential of something like a Chinese healthcare system is humongous, right? So there are definitely opportunities yep. in sectors like that. Um, and so I'd say, you know, I'd say something like like healthcare and then also consumer discretionary, just everyday brands that we are familiar with and that we go out for, you know, the, you know, the, the big, big companies that you know about. Um, I think those are two, two sectors that definitely have a load of great companies that, uh, that people can get diversify into. Yeah. Something very interesting this evening is that everyone is seems to be concentrating all the uh, focus on US market, right? Maybe it's because yeah. it's only like, two hours away from the start of the U.S. market. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, like, it's understandable. Yeah, it's understandable. Yeah, well, you know, I, I would like to see something more towards the Singapore and Hong Kong market. Okay, <laughs> how about the next question? Let's see. Can you... I, I, think, we, I think we saw that just now. Right, yeah. yeah. Next one. Oh, no, but I think we still have a few more questions. Okay. Um, that I have here. Let's see. What kind of portfolio should I consider for diversification 
what stocks for newbies like me? Okay, so what kind of what kind of uh, stocks for diversification, right? For newbies? Yeah. Um, I think if you're just starting out, um, you know, there are some really interesting big cap stocks, mega cap stocks that we've all heard of. I mean, in terms of in terms of things you've probably heard of, I mean, like a Walmart or sort of like a Costco are great, reliable sort of bedrock stocks. I think that are a part of the U.S. economy, you know, and, and everyone's familiar with, and they've been growing for for years. Um, and in terms of the tech space, maybe you're looking at like sort of like a Microsoft or Apple or an Amazon, you know, they're sort of the bedrock stocks just because they're such big businesses. They're very cash generative, they're very profitable and they're still growing. Um, so I think, you know, there, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of options for people looking and, you know, I, I guess if you're in Singapore, everyone talks about DBS as being one of those stocks just because it's yep. viable as a bank. Yep. Um, so if you're looking at something more closer to home, um, but if you're looking overseas at the U.S., then obviously I think there are those big consumer names. There are some big tech names, you know, maybe a, a healthcare, you have Johnson & Johnson, which is a really, really well-known blue chip stock. Uh, continue to make money. It will continue to, you know, to, to plot along. Um, but it won't be super exciting, but that's fine because I think you just need to build a base for yourself if you are starting out to be familiar with everything um, and to kind of, you know, at least put your money into the market to get it working for you. So, um, yeah, so those are some ideas. I think they're all great businesses. Yeah. Okay, I think this is the question on are there any ongoing costs when buying ETFs? And I think I saw other questions on ETFs. But I think today is not the day for us to talk about ETFs because we would be putting something, shedding more lights in the upcoming weeks. Yeah. But I like this question. Um, mm -hmm. What financial matrix are important to look at before investing in a stock? I think, yeah, it's an interesting question from Crystal. From Crystal. Okay, so yeah. in terms of like, um, in terms of, it's metrics, like what you look for in a business. I, I believe so. Yeah, financial matrix. Yeah. It's okay. like, yeah. I mean, for me, the first thing I look at is cash flow, like free cash flow. That is just really important just to see how much money like the company is generating on a free cash flow basis um, is key to understanding if that company is going to, you know, be throwing off more profit in the future. I think that to me is, is one of the big ones. Everyone obviously talks about revenue growth and, you know, um, you know, how's that performing on revenue and margins. I think if you're looking at, um, sort of more tech type, uh, sort of like fast growth stocks, you know, gross margins are important. Um, but I think for me, free cash flow, if you're looking at the strength of a business is really important just to understand how much cash flow it's actually generating. Um, I'd say so free cash flow and operating cash flow, I think are the two that I tend to look at on a, on a sort of, um, on a strength of a business basis. And if that is improving, if it's maybe negative, but it's improving and you like the business and you like the idea, then I think that's something that you, uh, you can be happy with. Yeah. Yeah, but um, what's your view that, you know, 10 years ago when I started, just started my investment journey is that I tend to look at um, earnings per share or even uh, the dividends, you know. Yeah. Um, because now, like, for example, this morning, I just saw some stocks, right, that dividends are over 9% at current market because mm -hmm. um, the previous value uh, a year ago and today, it dropped almost 20 to 30%. Mm. It's the dividend yield, because especially we talk about investing long term, What's, yep. your, what's your take? Well, I think the dividend yield is, if you're investing for dividends in mind, uh, I think the dividend yield is probably one of the least important. Or I, I think when I started investing, I thought about the dividend yield as well. But as I've sort of in, been investing longer and longer, I've kind of started to ignore the dividend yield just because if it's 9%, there's something wrong with that dividend. Uh, it's either been, like the share price is either being cut in half or they've cut their dividend like 50%, right? Because it's no way that you're getting sort of a great business growing its dividend and it's offering a 9% yield. So usually anything over sort of like five, 6% is like kind of got my alarm bells ringing for me in terms of the dividend. Um, so what I look at is the dividend track record, right? The DPS, the dividend per share track record. Has that been growing? Um, and has it been growing consistently, right? Is it something that's been growing for like one or two years and then they cut their dividend? Um, or has it been growing for like 20 years? If it's been growing for 20 years and it continues to grow, you know, above inflation for 20 years, 30 years, that's great. Um, so for me, it's more about the long term. 
Uh, it's has it been consistent? Does its business perform? And is it backed up by a growing dividend? Um, the yield in the end will you'll get there, right? With the yield, it'll be fine if you invest now on a cost basis and, and the yield is like one percent, but they grow their dividend like six hundred percent in the next ten years. You'll have, you'll be investing on a on a yield basis of like seven percent right now, right? In ten years, yep. so it, it's all about like looking out to the future and thinking about the sustainability. I think it's more about the sustainability rather than this has got a great high yield, but my capital, I'm going to lose like 50% maybe in the next year. <laughs> so I think there's, um, you, you have to think of it, it will put a different like hat on when you, when you talk about yield. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I think we're coming to the end, uh, Tim. Uh, for, for those questions, you know, we have yet to respond. Uh, we will either respond to you privately or, you know, in our next couple of series, that upcoming series. So mm. today we've come to the end of the session. So just a friendly reminder and a calling. Do remember to follow us on our social media channels and also sign up for our upcoming sessions. So before we end, um, that's everyone staying back for the $10 grab vouchers. So for Zoom, once you exit the session, there will be a survey that will be prompted immediately. For those who are watching via Facebook Live, please click on the link on the comment box below and complete the survey. But do always remember to include your name, email address, and mobile number for us to contact you for your winnings. So thank you and see you in the next session. Thanks guys. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.